So there's a variety of different oncological emergencies that can occur. Patients will not always present with the with, uh, symptoms of their malignancy itself, but will present with some sort of a secondary consequence of their malignancy and present uh, critically ill. Superior vena cava syndrome is one of these. Now, the original def description of the superior vena cava syndrome was back in the 1800s and actually was associated with cases of syphilis, where the infection caused an acute airtitis, which then caused inflammation and obstruction of the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava itself is, a, as you know, is a very thin-walled, low-pressure system, which is essentially trapped within the chest, and so is there subject to all of the pressures that, uh, that are applied from without. It is also very easily obstructed, um, and a variety, wide variety of different mediastinal masses can easily obstruct uh, blood flow. The most common malignancies that are associated with, uh, with superior vena cava syndrome is the non-small non cell lung cancer. About 50% of all cases of superior vena cava syndrome are uh, caused by a non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancers obviously are very malignant and in, in about 22% of all cases of superior vena cava syndrome are actually the cause uh, caused by, by that one. Now, lymphoma, which many people associate more, more frequently with, uh, with superior vena cava syndrome because of the fact that it, causes, it can cause a very large, bulky disease very quickly, is actually only associated with about 12% 12, uh, 12 of all cases of superior vena cava syndrome. Following that, there is a smaller number of, of uh, other malignancies that can cause uh, mediastinum uh, obstruction, metastases from a wide variety of different locations, germ cell tumors, as you know, can cause very bulky lymphadenopathy very quickly, but only account for about 3% of all cases. Mesotheliomas and thymomas also, as you can well imagine, are responsible for, for superior vena cava syndrome, but only account for about a uh, 3% of all cases of the condition. So facial edema is the most common finding associated with superior vena cava syndrome. The vast majority of patients will present, will have that as their primary complaint. But then when you explore their history with them, you'll often find that this has been going on slowly, progressively, over the course of the last number of weeks, um, maybe even up to a few months. They may also notice that they've been developing increasing dyspnea, primarily when they're at rest, and especially when they're lying supine, as the vessels are becoming that much more compressed, causing further engorgement of the uh, head and upper neck uh, and neck uh, region. They'll also have a cough and may complain of chest pain and hoarseness uh, as frequent uh, uh, other symptoms associated with their, uh, with their uh, presentation. Now, most of these symptoms are not just due to the venous compression, but are also as a result primarily of the malignancy itself. So invasion of the airway uh, can cause the cough and the chest pain, as well as hemoptysis. Um, but then you can also get um, the hoarseness, which is caused by impingement on the recurrent laryngeal uh, nerve. The uh, essential uh, investigations are the ones that you would normally perform, blood work, x-rays, ECGs, um, and then even an, an echocardiogram, which you can easily obtain at the bedside now, are very, um, are very helpful in helping to make an initial diagnosis. Um, and the vast majority of uh, minimally invasive procedures are quite safe to do. Um, and this includes not just, uh, not just central lines and uh, arterial lines, but even things like bronchoscopies, so long as you keep an eye on making sure that they're properly positioned and are not in a, any acute distress or hypoxemic. So when it comes to treating the superior vena cava syndrome, it's important that the first thing you understand is that there is no need to panic nor is there any need to immediately treat the underlying malignancy unless there's actually something, something critically wrong with the patient, such as an airway obstruction or the obstruction of the veins has caused cerebral edema, in which case then you have to move a little bit faster. But it's more important than part of your treatments that you actually obtain the diagnosis first. Because if you start throwing chemo and radiotherapy at somebody when you don't have, an, un, un, you don't have a complete understanding of what the malignancy is, you may end up developing a problem of having no diagnosis ever because you've caused undiagnosable necrosis. So you have to make sure that you absolutely are certain that you have a piece of tissue and you have a diagnosis before you, you can start treatment. 
This includes even steroids necessarily uh, can cause necrosis and uh, li uh, liquefaction of malignancies such as lymphomas, and you have to be careful about treating them empirically unless they actually have some critical airway obstruction or some other consequence of this. The vast majority of people can be treated symptomatically initially. This includes giving them oxygen and keeping the head of the bed up so that they're not getting into trouble with, uh, with further venous engorgement. If they have uh, evidence of uh, occlusion of their, uh, or clotting in their, uh, in their venous system, especially if it extends upwards into their, uh, into their sagittal sinuses, you should probably start anticoagulating them sooner rather than later. As part, of your, uh, as part of your treatment for these people to try and symptomatically relieve them, you should talk, consider talking to your interventional radiologist to see if there is any other options available on that front. Sometimes intervascular stenting may help relieve some of the symptoms and also allow, buys you time to, in order to get the diagnosis. But probably the most important thing that you need to understand about this condition is that unless there's absolutely a critical need to deal with the airway, or their cerebral edema from obstruction, it's, pro it's very much more important that you get the diagnosis first and then start the appropriate treatments. All right, well, that's everything. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, don't uh, be afraid to leave comments in the section below or contact me directly.